you first. Daniel Kraft, thanks a lot for joining us. Now, you did an incredible presentation on Saturday. I have been watching you make the rounds around the world. You have been on so many different shows. Um, just real quick, I met you at TED. I want to say it was maybe TED in 2005 or six, and you were talking about the Merrill Minder, this, this tool that you invented to actually get bone marrow and stem cells uh, in a fairly non-invasive way. That's what you were working on back then. And, and since then, you've just exploded. Just give us real quick the transition from going from Stanford to where you're at now. Oh, uh, well, you know, I did the sort of traditional, uh, you know, med school path, uh, you know, uh, in the lab, um, um, kind of blending science and medicine. Uh, I think when I, but I've always was someone who liked uh, multiple fields. Like when I had to finish medical school and pick a residency, I think I almost did emergency medicine, orthopedics, general surgery. Uh, and then I ended up combining it and doing medicine and pediatrics. Um, and, but I'd always had these crazy interests and Stanford was a great place for medical school because I could, I did actually six years instead of the usual four. I spent um, a bunch of time doing space systems engineering. I went on a three month research trip to Nepal. Uh, I did research at NASA down the street. And when, anyway, when I finished residency at Harvard and came back, um, I was kind of back in the narrow academic bucket and uh, feeling a little bit frustrated. So I was, so I ended up branching into doing Stanford Biodesign, which was a new program at the time with the, with the key idea that you've got an amazing campus at Stanford, you've got engineering, medical school, law, et cetera. Um, and it was all about finding unmet needs, pain points to solve. Um, and so the pain point, you mentioned this marrow miner was that I was a bone marrow transplant fellow trying to harvest bone marrow and I can probably find a picture of this, this in a minute. Um, and uh, it was you know, a painful procedure. It takes an hour to do hundreds of punctures. And came up with this device called the Marrow Miner, which is a sort of minimally invasive tool to do that. And sort of went through the whole rows of getting that through the FDA and a startup, et cetera. So, uh, so it was a bit of a circuitous path to move into medical devices and then got involved in digital health. And then the whole Singularity University thing sort of cooked up. And I knew Peter DeMandis from way back at International Space University. And that sort of, again, enabled me to sort of be in this inter interconnected mode. And the other piece, I was still a fellow. I went to TED and probably the first time in 2006. And it was, it was kind of like I found my tribe. It was a mix of really interesting people from all these different worlds. And I was sort of out of my usual medical silo. And that unleashed a whole bunch of possibilities. That makes sense. Well, I mean, you're a rock star back then. And now it looks like everybody wants you. I know you're doing something with Salim uh, in two weeks from now which is an interesting pro uh, We have Salim on the show this week, which yep. is great. And um, the exponential medicine route, can you explain when we talk about exponential, we understand what that means, the doubling, 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 but you really look far into the future. How are you able to see where trends are going much more clearer than most doctors? I'm not sure about seeing better than others. It's more like uh, maybe I'll, I'll see something in the clinic or research realm and go, well, why, is it, why are we still using fact machines? Or why are we still handing out piles of pills to patients they don't ha take half the time or using pill cutters. And so then I applied a bit of this lens of like, wow, what could it be? And we've all, we're all sort of science fiction buffs. You imagine seeing, I was just on with the, with the X Prize. Um, I helped come up with the tricorder X Prize. Like how do you envision that future? Bones McCoy able to, you know, wand your patient and, 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 uh, and get results right away. And so um, kind of sort of being in the mix of academia and technology and Silicon Valley and seeing that university, it kind of provides a bit of that, you know, overly used term exponential lens to go a couple more clicks of Moore's law. And, you know, what's the iPhone 15 going to look like? Or what would VR be in, in two more clicks? Or where are we with the $100, $50 genome? So it's not about any one of those things, but how you put them together um, that enables you to sort of think what would be possible if you match these things up. And a lot of sort of what I ended up predicting probably in my TED talk from 2011 is sort of now commonplace, you know, apps for this and virtual reality for that and robotics and 3D printing and so it's a matter of sometimes just see a couple more clicks down the possibility route. And then hopefully catalyzing others to sort of get out of the way enough because health and medicine for a variety of reasons is pretty risk adverse and slow to change. And as I think we talked about in the metal group uh, on Saturday, part of what the COVID thing is gonna hopefully catalyze is some better things to emerge like faster, more available telemedicine and, um, and sort of newer ways of doing public health as well. So let's start with that. Guys, I know a lot of you had questions on Saturday. We're unable to answer those. Today is the Q&A where you have some time with Daniel. 
Uh, Daniel's joining us for, uh, I hope, for the next 50 minutes. Daniel Kraft, we're diving into your medical questions across the board. Of course, let's talk about COVID. Um, why are certain viruses, specifically this one, we see them pop up every so often. The last one to actually have this type of traction would have gone back to the measles 100 years ago. What's so unique about this and why is the spreadability so strong? Well, I mean, actually, coronaviruses aren't anything that new. This is called, you know, SARS COVID 2, because the prior one, which was, which was SARS, had the SARS name. There's one called MERS. There's also um, uh, Ebola and others that are quite similar. What's different about those is they have much more, um, uh, much higher fatality rates, but aren't quite as transmissible. And so, in some cases, I was on with Larry Brilliant, who's the head of the pandem ending pandemics and has done a lot of work in curing smallpox and other things. He almost calls this a practice pandemic. I mean, it's horrible, but still the mortality rate overall is 1% or less, depending on your age group, so that's more. So, um, so in, in fact, coronaviruses aren't new. What was new about this one was that basically nobody had any immunity. It was completely novel to the, to the human species. And um, so we already have a leg up because we understand coronaviruses. We've had some vaccines made to them in the past. There's some antiviral drugs, but um, it's not a complete new, you know, new, back, new virus from out of the blue completely. And but when we talk about uh, a practice virus, we're looking at whatever disease X is going to be. And disease X is the one that has a higher mortality rate with the same type of contagion that floats around the world, right? I mean, it's, it would be similar to what we have today, but it would be mortality would be much, much higher, right? Is that disease X? There's, there's two things. Like there's one, there's the infectivity rate, meaning I think for this right now, depending on how we're doing with our measures, it's like two to three. Like one person gets it, they infect two to three more, and then that's why the exponentials go up and the doubling time is fast. If it's something like one, if we're all staying in our homes and no one else gets infected or zero, that's what slows down and extends the curve and eventually hopefully burns itself out. Um, the other thing is the, the mortality, and one, one of the diseases like, like SARS, you know, it's like 50% mortality, but people were only infectious when they were super sick. So it was easier to identify them and snuff them out. One of the challenges with COVID is that we're learning a lot of folks are relatively um, um, asymptomatic, particularly early on, and they're still shedding virus and infecting other people. So that's why it's like a little bit more insidious. And you going out, are you wearing a mask? Are you having your family wear a mask? Tell me about what the getup is for you to go up to Whole Foods. Yeah. What do you do? I only went out like literally twice in the last two weeks uh, to Safeway last night and down the hill to the market. And I put on my sort of um, about a month ago when everyone was starting to search for masks, I bought some of those uh, ones with the, uh, like they're almost for pollution or skiing and they have the carbon little things in them. So sort of like the equivalent of N95s, but they're reusable. So I, I, I kind of look like I'm about to rob a bank. <laughs> so that's what I wore. And I wore gloves. That was basically it. That was my only outing last two weeks, which was really Safeway last night and this today. Before that, we were getting um, Apple, Apple uh, sorry, Amazon Home Fresh, and then they ran it out of delivery spots. So uh, I think if you go out and you're doing basic measures, it's fine. But do be mindful of you know, what you touch there when you get home. Clean, clean your phone. A lot of people are touching their phone when they're out. Um, but once you're in your space and you're sort of sequestered, that's a whole other story. And how about your kids? What are you doing to make sure that they are safe like you are? They haven't left the house either. I mean, they've been out of school now for almost two weeks. And I'm, I think we're not going to get them back. My, my son's a kindergarten, my older one, which is a bit of a shame because it's such a key year. Kindergarten, they still have home-based stuff. My wife's been doing a good job of doing home super school. But, you know, we're just staying in our neighborhood. It's got, we're not, you know, we're in Portola Valley. There's walking. There's parks that aren't really open. But it's not like we can't go outside. I, what's really challenging is like in India where they just did a lockdown. A lot of folks live in very tight quarters or a whole portion of the population is shut down the, tr the train system. People can't get homes. So, I mean, I think many of us are lucky to have enough physical space in backyards, but for a lot of places, um, high rise apartments, et cetera, it's a very different story. Yeah, and if we look at that curve, we see that China is down here on the recovery side. They're at least reporting that the recovery and something like South Korea is just about to hit the tip, the top from what we're seeing all the way down to India being at the very beginning point. So if India is at the beginning point and China's at the, let's say, recovery point, India is about to go through hell more than anything because of the close proximity of everyone, right? Yeah, I saw pictures on the news yesterday of literally, you know, their train stations and there's thousands of people packed around their trains and some are wearing masks, but boy, that is a um, tinderbox. And again, 
the challenge in the U.S. is all the stuff we're seeing now and the, the infection rate zooming, the death rates in, in, in New York, you know, the folks who were in Daytona Beach partying on the beach two weeks ago are now the ones who transmitted to their grandparents and a week later they're getting sick. So it's, it's really hard to say at time zero, we, we know what's gonna happen in two or three weeks in some of those places. And we know that it is a two week just, just, just Jason period or is it actually potentially longer? I think in general, it's like seven to five to seven days. I think it, it might depend on who the host is. And again, one of the things I mentioned on our call on Saturday is a lot of different presentations. It's not just fever and cough. A friend of mine um, just published work out of at L LA. He's at Cedar sinai the GI symptoms. A lot of folks are presenting with just fever and bad diarrhea or you know, not even high fever. So that can be a presenting sign. So I think there's a, a wide variety of presentations and um, Younger kids, teenagers, maybe almost completely asymptomatic, or it's just like a minor cold. So it's it's hard to know one size fits all. Now, anybody in this group, we have uh, 34 people on the call right now. If you have a question for Daniel, just put it right side of the chat, and then I'll bring you up. And I want to make sure you take take advantage of this time, guys. Daniel is a great guy, but he's not really all that accessible. It's a rarity that we have a pandemic to keep him at home so we can get a hold of him. Um, so hey, Daniel, as you go through this real quick. And I know we just said that this is a test, uh, uh, a test pandemic. Have we seen anything that looked like it could have been potentially disease X that was stopped because of proximity, because it didn't have the, the capability of being so contagious? I mean, I think the, the World Health or you know, public health elements responded pretty well to H1N1 and to SARS and to MERS. Uh, you know, those weren't that long ago. And the number of people who actually died was relatively small, but it was easy to, relatively easier to pick up. And because it had that higher um, death rate and also my later uh, infectivity rate, it was a little easier to do what's called contact tracing. So there's a, a big, um, hopefully later this week, Friday or Monday, we're going to roll out this WHO app. People keep coming at us, are you going to have contact tracing? Meaning early in a disease, classic public health is, let's say, let's say Ken has symptoms and he tests positive. Well, wouldn't it be nice to know everybody who Ken was around the last five days and could we use his phone trail, just like you know, your, your Google Maps data trail to go, wow, he was you know, John, Sally, and Bob, and Bob, then we can contact them and put them into quarantine or, or track their symptoms. That's well, China's possible. doing that. China's doing that by actually tracking data signals and WeChat and uh, it's pretty intense. China is doing this, but the United States having the, the capability of doing that is uh, pretty, going pretty deep into privacy issues. Yeah, Singapore, Israel's doing that as well. And you might argue it's a wartime environment. We need to relax our privacy statuses for a period of time. The challenge is there's like Hungary and others are really using this as the power grab as well. And maybe things will never get relaxed again. So there's some dark sides to this, but you could argue the sort of draconian measures that happened in China, if we believe their data was quite effective. Um, and we've done nothing close in the US. Not here to talk about politics, but the Patriot really came from 9-11, right? That's, those are those issues pop up. Last question for me, then we're going to dive into questions from people out there. Uh, if I get COVID-19 and I go through the process, it's not too serious, and I recover, am I now immune to get it for a while? Or is there a certain limited type of time parameter? Yeah, that's a great question. I think we're now starting to see the rollout of these tests. So when you have an infection, normally your immune system kicks in, your B cells start to make antibodies, your T cells start to activate, and, um, and you can first see this IgG peak and then IgM or, or vice versa. And now we can measure those in your blood. And so there's now tests rolling out to start to see our folks sort of in their convalescent stage. And hopefully does that mean they're protected? One of the potential therapies is to take the serum from someone who's re recovered from COVID and use the antibodies in their blood to give to someone who's sick. And that's been done in the past with other um, viral infections. And there's some startups and other biotech companies trying to make those antibodies like monoclonal antibodies directly, not from another patient. So there is that approach. And one of the, thing, one of the ways we're gonna sort of get back to work is we may all be tested frequently for both the disease, uh, and hopefully that'll be you know, a five minute test like was rolled out by Abbott last week. Uh, also, um, the ability to check your, your serum and see if you're immune, and hopefully that immunity sticks. So maybe, Ken, you'll get a red dot on your forehead or a card, and we'll go, okay, you're, 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 you're past infection. You're now um, sort of immunologically protected, and you can't pass it on to others. And that will hopefully enable a task force to go back to work in the healthcare side as well as across society. But the challenge is if we start bringing people back too early and we don't have some of that herd immunity, 
um, that the sort of all the efforts we have to constrain uh, through through physical distancing is going to uh, be have to be done again. Makes sense. Hey, by the way, I know you have the uh, Starship behind you. You definitely have the J.J. Abrams sun light flare going on oh, that uh, appeared in every sounds... Star Trek. <laughs> so I'm going to call upon you guys that have asked questions. First, I'm going to Mr. Richard Burke. Hey, Richard, you have a question. What's your question for Mr. Kraft? Well, I think he almost answered it there. Is that are we testing for the virus or are we testing for the antibodies uh, in our, our system? You know, right now, the, the classic tests are testing for the virus itself, and they usually use something called PCR, which is why it's been sort of, you need to have the primer that matches that exact, uh, this exact virus, and then get it through basically a machine that cycles it. So you're taking a very, very small amount of RNA and amplifying it, and then measuring whether it's there or not, and you have to have controls as well. And so that's why it's been, it, it takes a while. Uh, the early test takes several hours. There's a bunch of activity, as I mentioned in the talk, trying to make um, much faster, even home-based versions. Um, so there's a variety of techniques, but that's the basic way. The, the convalescent side, the antibody, that's not gonna show up right away. When you're first infected, you're not gonna have an immune response. So you can't measure that on you know, day zero or day seven. It's something I think we'll learn. Does that start to pop up you know, at, at five days in or two weeks out? Um, and then the question, the big question, does that mean you're protected downstream, at least for this version? We still don't know yet whether there'll be different strains and mutations, just like Influenza is basically the same. We all get the flu shot every year because the, um, the, the surface of the flu modifies or changes and mutates. And so our immune system doesn't see that mutation. That's why we need a new flu shot every year. And we're usually guessing uh, from the data around the world which flu vaccine is going to be best each year. It's not perfect year to year. So hope, hopefully we don't have a situation like the common flu or we'll need to be vaccinated once a year for, for COVID version you know, 2022. There you go. Now I'm going to go to AJ Jackson, who is joining us from the cockpit of something. Nice. Uh, AJ, before I, I ask your question, uh, AJ, you guys are supposed to be on tour right now throughout Europe, right? Yeah, the, the last date we played was LA and the next date was Milan. And that was like oh. March 15th. And I mean, we're talking about sold out shows everywhere. Yeah, so it was close. It was close. We were like, last minute let's see how how long we can hold out before we have to cancel but very glad we canceled yeah you canceled it actually if you start traveling even more in the united states you probably would have had to cancel everything also it would have been yeah we would have been trapped over there for sure and how are you guys practicing being separated from one another oh um you know at first it was great i think to kind of rest from two months of tour and and now it's uh slowly terrifying but we're finding new kind of different ways to try to do things to connect people together. I don't know about, I've been watching Bare Naked Ladies perform on a regular basis, which is a lot of fun. AJ, right. what's your question for Daniel Kraft? Yeah, Daniel, so um, I think uh, try to get most of my facts from movies, but after watching Outbreak and Contagion, just how accurate is it to find the source animal of the outbreak helps you find the correct vaccine? And I know they said pangolins and possibly bats, but are they actively searching in Wuhan and the market where this started? Is this vital to finding the vaccine or cure or not? Yeah, I don't think it's vital from my perspective at this point, the cat's out of the bag or the virus out of the bag. I know, I think there's a bunch of conspiracy theories. Did they, I think they torched or burned down that market pretty quick. It's nearby some facility where they did research. Some very smart folks I know have looked at the genetics of this. There's no evidence it was human made, et cetera. Um, but I think um, now that it's sort of, trends moved and, and by that was called a wet market i believe so they had like live bats there and chickens and goats and everything and so everything moved together and they then often sell you the live uh bat or bird and kill it right there it's called a wet market so that is a hotbed for interspecies interconnectivity and how it may have jumped but i think now that we know the the virus and we know the immunology of it um there's a ton of great work going on across biotech at least several several uh, vaccines that are in trials or about to start trials, uh, as well as several drug approaches. That's not like we don't, don't need to go back like in the movie plot and find the actual animal, I think, to make a difference. It would be helpful again to understand, hopefully retrospectively, how this one got out and how we could protect from that in the future. And maybe the future of, of pandemic responses that we'll all have sort of rapid virus testers in our in our home connected to our smartphones where we'll be able to pick up hotspots early and then 
potentially even have sort of universal vaccines that can mm. uh, can make a difference. Uh, I think even Larry Page of Google fame has funded this project out of DC called uh, the Universal Flu Vaccine, um, where they're literally trying to do for the common flu, because again, that does kill a lot of people every year, has a lot of mort mortality and morbidity, something that can be pan-influenza. Maybe we can find something else to be pan-coronavirus that would help in this regard too. AJ, thanks a lot for your question. Okay. Let's go to Mr. Alex Barkalov. Alex, what is your question? Let me find where Alex is. Alex, I'm looking for all you guys. It's nice to see all you guys joining us today. It really is. Uh, Alex, where are you? Here I am. There you are. Yeah. Alex, let yeah. me see your camera. Hey. Can, I see, can I see your oh, camera, I'm in, the, I'm, in, I'm in the dark. Uh, I've, I've, I've had, ter guys, I've been have terrible, terrible insomnia. That's, uh, I'm not sick from this, or actually, I may have been. Uh, I had a bad flu two weeks ago, and I'm over it. But uh, So if you don't mind, I'm in, the complete, in complete darkness right now. And, but, that, and um, that's going to help because you're watching the show and yes. in the light by in the the monitor is going to allow you to fall asleep. Is that what you're hoping? Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> Alex, what's your question? Yeah. So, so really, look. If, if we look at uh, the rate at which Germany is testing, U.S. is testing. I think they're reporting like a hundred thousand tests a day. Um, to refer to an old philo philosophical um, question, if an infection happens in the forest and no one measures it, did it happen? And in that case, um, we, you know, obviously we're fighting the curve, but we don't know if um, 200,000, you know, Americans have been infected, as we're now reporting, or a little bit over that, to, um, I don't know, millions. We, we just aren't measuring, we, we don't know. And while that's, that may be a scary thought, we also may be really highly overreaching the mortality rate. I, again, I don't know these things. I'm just asking the question. Um, the common flu infects, according to WHO, 1 billion people annually. So what, what is the upward limit of this? And uh, if we fought in the curve, of course, it'll be a lot lower. But uh, what do you expect to see in terms of uh, you know, what we don't know. Right now, we're only testing people who are, uh, seem to have the advanced symptoms and all that. Mm -hmm. So my jumble of a question is, you know, what, what is this really out there? Um, and are we only measuring, are we only measuring um, uh, uh, new infections? Or are we measuring, um, you know, existing infections and we're just discovering, are we just discovering new infections or are we measuring new infections? Okay. Thank you, Alex. Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. I mean, it's, I think, frankly, uh, shameful about how like, South Korea, in their first week, we're doing, you know, $100,000, 100,000 tests. Uh, I don't know the exact number. It took us like a month to catch up with where South Korea was in their first week. And we had all the capability to do it. I think we were offered help from the WHO and CDC and others turned it down. So we were sort of blind. So like, just because you see a number does not mean that's the real number. That's the tested positive number. And it, even in New York right now, it's almost impossible to get a test unless you're maybe a healthcare worker. Here in California, it's still difficult and still often taking a week or more to get the results back. So while testing is ramping up, it doesn't mean we have an accurate picture. And that's part of the huge problem here. What we really need uh, going forward and retrospectively and in, in areas of the world where it's not yet um, truly pandemic is to have that ability to do rapid, accurate testing and to have that, other, otherwise we're, we're sort of blinded. And you might remember when Trump was saying, I don't want that cruise ship to dock because our numbers will go up and I like the numbers where they are. Well, that means <laughs> the numbers that are positive and that's pure like, you know, uh, see no evil, but uh, creating evil. So to answer your question, I think, and I'm not a pure test expert, uh, we are sort of been flying a little bit blind and the numbers are gonna get worse in a sense when we have more test results available. All right, so guys, if you want to ask, if hang on, me? hang on. If you want to ask a question, everyone, I need you to have your video on. Because I see a lot of videos off. I want your cameras on if you're going to ask a question. Bill Dorfman, what is your? And I'm trying to follow an order, everyone. So if you have a question, please put it in the chat so it's in order. Because there's a lot of questions that are popping up, and you're texting me individually. Don't do that. Put it inside the chat. Bill, what's your question? So mine is a little update for you that hasn't been published yet. My best friend is the medical director for Los Angeles County. She has 58 counties. 
all of the data that we've been getting is basically fictitious. They, they really have been guessing. Today was the actual first day that they were able to look at the models and come up with some real accurate assessment as to what's happening. And the good news is, is that we're not spiking the way they thought we were. This California, isolation- you mean. California is not. California <laughs> is actually doing a pretty damn good job. Now, you know, it's not predictable, but right now we're not getting the spikes that they were, that they were um, anticipating. The number of tests is what keeps us a little bit in the dark. However, when people get sick enough, they go to the hospital. She's working with every hospital in LA County and they know exactly how many people are going in. And so this social isolation is the only thing that's actually working right now. The other thing is to wear masks. In the beginning, they were saying, oh no, the mask doesn't matter that much, blah, 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 blah. I don't know what's happening with this thing right now. Whose screen is that? That's oh, mine. Just no, that exact, yeah, just on that exact point. Um, this data is just for- Well, let me finish. Yeah. So uh, wear masks. Um, it, it absolutely is not gonna hurt. It will only help, especially, you know, like we talked about earlier, you don't know when you're infectious in the early stages of this. Once you do a okay, test this. for the antibodies. Bill, Bill there's a lot of questions. There's a lot of questions for Daniel, a lot. Is, okay. is, is there a way you could sum that up quickly? I'm done. I just, okay. just to riff off of Bill's point. Yes, we are bending the curve a bit and the graph I'm showing right now just came out this morning. This is San Francisco based data. And you can see uh, that the the, num the case new case number is, is going down. So um, that's definitely a, a positive. Um, and it's based on the fact that in the Bay Area, we had pretty early um, uh, lockdown. And so it made a difference here. Um, so and are we looking at exactly what Bill said regarding the mask? If we look at the countries that did do masks, that would be Hong Kong, Macau, Japan, Korea, compared to the ones that did not enforce masks, we saw the curve actually go down in those areas, correct? So masks actually do play a critical part? I'm not sure, I'm not sure if it's causation or correlation. Um, I'm sure it plays some role. Uh, I don't think if you guys have a bunch of N95 masks, go bring them to your hospital, but a basic mask will do when you're out and about if you're feeling okay. Um, so I, I think we're still seeing new data. With, new data was published by MIT this week that you know six feet may not be far enough. If someone's actually really coughing around you, the the the, the the viral particles can go a bit farther and hang in the air a bit longer. So in general, it certainly can't hurt to wear a mask when you're out and about. It's hard to do a controlled trial on that, but it does seem to have some role. All right. Like I said, I want your camera on if you're going to ask a question. Let's go to Mr. Nick Bishop. Nick, what is your question? Nick. There you go. On mute. There we are. I'm here. Yes, sir. Simple question is, how surprised were you and let's call it the medical community that this whole thing happened at all. Um, I remember starting to look at this, obviously, as, as the news was popping out in, in, in China and um, other smart, smarter folks than me also were looking at the data and looking at this R number, you know, how effective it was and the death number and pretty quickly calculating this could be a significant challenge here. I think what we didn't predict was how far the US at least was gonna be behind on the testing elements that were done so well in at least South Korea and Singapore. And Singapore, for example, got almost down to a case rate of zero and it popped up again when people flew in from other locations. So um, I also think, you know, the intelligence committee in the Senate had early intel. Some of them were selling their shares in early, Jan early to late January. Um, um, so it's a bit disappointing that our public health system, which has been fragmented and defunded, um, hasn't been able to respond as well as we might have liked. Um, and someone put it on the chat, there was a study done at Hop, it was called, I don't remember what it was called. They, they did a simulation of this sort of uh, exact thing about a year ago and had predicted, you know, 2 million US deaths. It didn't start changing policy or funding. Um, so mm -hmm. we've had, there's a great piece by my friend, uh, uh, David Ewing Duncan in Vanity Fair this week about all the Cassandras who've been warning about this and why nothing sort of happened. Right, thank you so much. Dan Daniel Clark, let's go to another question. That's from Mr. Keith Montgomery. Keith, what is your question? Oh, unmute yourself, Keith. 
So how's that? Go. Am I unmuted, guys? There you go. All right, good. Uh, hey, Daniel. So um, uh, data, that's my background. So the data that's being collected, I've been looking into it with different data scientists and different companies I've looked at. And some, most of them just don't know what they're doing and don't have the background. And you need at least two years of data to be able to actually make anything from the infectious diseases. What I'm looking for is the other companies are collecting data in different ways. So I can start to mash that up or, or at least advise them on that. Uh, the, who's mashing up the data? What's the question? So people mashing up the data with the data that's already existent and say the DARPA data sets that have been existing in the last 10 years and things like that. So real, real solid data that, as you know, the data, people might not know this, but a lot of ministries collect data and give it as a PDF. It's so fragmented. It's <laughs> ridiculous. The information you're getting mostly is just fake information. And so, and I, and I, and I'm not a big fake news kind of guy, but I've been looking at the data and I can see very clearly what's happening. So what I'm looking for is companies actually have the wherewithal, they know what they're doing and they're doing it through cellular, they have blockchain, they have all kinds of different things, but they are collecting, they have some kind of provenance around that. I mean, there's all sorts of data. There's a thing called flu trends. There's the Kins uh, thermometers, which could pick up temperature spikes early. That's been a form of data. I just put a link into this uh, new XPRIZE Pandemic Alliance, which I'm helping lead up for this task force. And it's part of it is to be a data data powered initiative. If you have a data set and others, right now the challenge in healthcare and across the, pen, across the spectrum is a lot of data is siloed in PDF formats and formats that don't talk to each other, and federated forms. And one of the things we were trying to do with this alliance is get data donated from multiple sources like Anthem. Healthcare, the insurance company has you know a decade worth of anonymized data that it might look at different infections. So if you're a data person and you want to get involved or any of you are involved in organizations that have unique or other data sets, um, go there. There's a place to sign up and you can start to contribute or at least uh, get your organizations involved. But um, I think in the future, we're going to hopefully, and this wasn't even the future. Now, there are several folks who have been looking for early pandemic or uh, infection elements. And you can tell from not just um, hospitalizations, but how people are searching for flu symptoms or um, social media reports. All these new sort of data forms are giving us hopefully earlier, earlier um, predictors and ways to track um, disease. So if you have a cellular phone site, I'd love to hear anything you have. That, that would be great. I'm going to actually send you something on uh, what they're doing in China, which is pretty mind blowing. Uh, yeah. Ralph Simon uh, er, sent it to me earlier today, and I think it's something that really is important to share, and I'll send it to you, Keith. Hey, we're with Daniel Kraft on this Metal Connect, which we do every Wednesday night with a different speaker from each week. Uh, from each Saturday, we bring them over, and it's great to have Daniel join us. I, if you want to ask a question, please make sure your video's on. Let's go to Kira. Akira, what is your question for Daniel? Wait, you you, Sorry, I had to unmute myself. Yeah, thanks, Ken. Uh, hey, Daniel, I'm part of the TED community, part of the A360 community. Uh, what? what? Back on mute. You, okay, you're unmuted. Go ahead again. No. So there. sorry, guys. I'm on my phone. It's really sketchy. Um, hey, Daniel, I'm in the TED community, A360 community, and I was just wondering, I feel like there's so much um, dysfunctionality in terms of global cooperation around this. And I watched an hour and a half of the three hour pandemic exercise called Event 21 that happened, 201, sorry, Event 201 that happened in October, 2019. And um, if anyone's seeing it, if you've seen it, it was a very organized, exercise for a fictional pandemic, a coronavirus pandemic. How could something like that happen and the entire world be so caught off guard and, and out of alignment just a few months later when things start to really take place? I mean, this is, this is not a political question. It's just a science, medical, global communication question. I mean, it's a great question. It's beyond kind of my pay grade, but I would say, uh, I think the, the takeaway from that was it was a coronavirus vaccine uh, pandemic. It had bad results in the U.S., like 2 million U.S. dead. It probably had some great takeaways, but how does that trend translate to budget that's passed to improve the CDC or put back in the pandemic response group that was built uh, during the SARS pandemic and the Obama years? Or, you know, it's kind of politics and, you know, the fierce urgency of now isn't to fund these sort of preventative things. I mentioned in the talk on Saturday, we practice reactive sick care, not proactive health care. And it's always hard to um, fund the things that prevent things. You know, it's sexier to cure the, the cancer, not to prevent it in the first place. 
And that's why sort of public health often sometimes suffers a bit. So I think now this has been a big wake up call. Hopefully it will catalyze a lot of positive action and collaboration. Uh, part of the challenge often is governments don't speak to each other in the right way. I mean, our trade war with China probably did not help um, getting information out that was valid from China early that may have given us an earlier leg up. I'm open to any other interpretations, anyone in the community who have better insights than I would on, on what the barriers are to getting. If you have a question, please put it inside the chat room. I'm going to get through all of them if I can. Hey, Daniel, what do you think about this thought of, let, let's look at the causality now of people not working, people, uh, especially in, um, let's say, the produce space. They, uh, they can't pick fresh vegetables. They can't supply uh, fresh vegetables, supply, supply chain changes. Do you see a breakdown in a pathway to where we're not going to get the fresh foods that we are accustomed to in the next couple of months because of the workers are unable to work, they can't get paid, or something in that sense? Um, the question for you, I'm not sure, is that really, I know, you know, uh, supermarkets and food supply is sort of um, essential work. So what is being prevented now? Are they not letting people pick the fruit in the fields because it's too close? I'm just wondering if you've seen anything. Like today, I, I thought it was interesting. Has anyone seen what Whole Foods might, you know, they might go on strike. If anyone's seen this. Hey, Ken, Ken? Yes, Dennis. All right, so uh, what happened is the uh, State Department uh, pulled visas from Mexicans coming across the border so they're not getting up to Salinas and Central Valley at a very critical time where we switch from Yuma to California to grow leafy greens. So broccoli, lettuce, cat, uh, you know, all leafy greens are going to get whacked. And in three or four months, you're going to see a tremendous spike because not only will it be a supply chain disruption, there will be no supply. Now, grains, which have pretty much automated and combines and John Deere stuff, you know, in the Midwest, aren't affected, but your stuff in California and Central Valley and Salina, massive impact. Because half the farm workers come up from Mexico and we're not letting them in. So, so yeah, we will have we go from very, very dire, it'll be dire for the supermarkets. That's and what for us, consumers. Yeah, so that's gonna affect our diets then too. I know Daniel's going, what? I didn't even think about that, right, Daniel? I was just thinking, I need to buy my like powdered greens now, right? I mean, there might be something- Well, that's why, that's why indoor farming is the future. Yeah, I, I was talking to Eric Oberholzer about that. That's exactly what he says, too. It protects from this situation and the that's automation right. of farming, too, which is yeah. ironic because that's a space with, where, where you're focused right now, Dennis. One of many, yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, so, I don't want you know, I could put up a video, but we have more important things to talk about today. I'll show you how all that works. Fully automated. No human touches on a product. Gets right to market. Pretty and cool. that's where I was going to go with that. I was wondering, Daniel, are we seeing... Uh, if we're getting our food from fast food or from different food preparation environments, where the people that work there, if they have the virus, they could spread it to the food that we're eating. It's certainly possible. Um, there's been a lot of work in the last just couple of weeks looking at you know how long does the virus live on plastic or cardboard or your mail. Um, if if there was someone who's a fast food worker, you know, sneezing into your burger, yeah, it, it's certainly possible. Hard to study that in a controlled trial. Um, that's why, you know, as much as you can uh, get food delivered or wash your veggies when you get home, can't be a bad thing. I think it's really the interesting, you know, point that was just brought up by Dennis. I mean, what are the downstream things two or, two or three months from now that we're just starting to think about now or other folks know a lot about that are going to be impactful? What could we do now to mitigate that? I'm not, I'm not sure on all of them, but there's a lot of downstream pieces that we've never been able to model out that are going to be important to understand. All right, let's continue with questions. I'm gonna go over to uh, Rob. Hey Rob, so many of you guys may not know this, but Rob, who's joining us, is the creator of Pictionary. And I'm wondering if Rob, if this happened 30 years ago, would the word Corona virus be one of those words we'd have to draw a picture for? Uh, it might be drawn a little differently, but you know, <laughs> everybody's playing Pictionary again. You know, games are popular. Everybody's, uh, you know, stuck where they are. So games, not just within the homes, but on Zoom, I played one with the university yesterday, so it's just a different dynamic, but it's still just a fun way just to forget about this shit for a little while. It's true. What's your question? So, some of us are, uh, you know, in the uh, over the 60 age group. Once we catch it, if we caught it, and we know we've got it, or the flu's coming, you know, zinc and all these other things, is there anything we can do to stop the progression 
happening or is it just a fait complete and off you go? Uh, number one, I love dictionary, so thank you. I used to be an addict, I was pretty good at it. Um, number two, uh, interesting time to think about um, our ability to connect socially and gaming and our mental health and how games and other ways of, whether it's video games or board games virtually can play a role in our, our mental health is important. To your question, I don't, I think there are obviously some key stuff. I mean, early on, I made sure our family had enough, you know, Tylenol and NyQuil and Gatorade and basic food. So if you're, depends if what your living situation is, if you're sick and your others in your household are not, you might want to be sequestered, um, sort of if you have an extra room and have them, you know, slide food under the mat. Um, how can you help take care of yourself? So a little bit is, you know, making sure you stay hydrated, things like Gatorade or Pedialyte. So you're not just drinking water, but getting enough, um, you know, sugar with uh, salt and potassium is important. I think zinc has been rumored to help a bit. Other folks are swearing by mega doses of vitamin C. I haven't seen anything to substantiate that. Probably can't hurt, uh, but you know, you know. So if you do have it, I would say it's all the basics you want to do. Make sure you're sleeping. Don't take Dayquil because that can keep you up. Um, the folk, I've had a few friends have had it. Their sort of coaching was to listen to your body and just and just. Uh, oh. Get as much rest as you can. If you do have something like a pulse oximeter, you can start to track what your imagination is doing. Someone needs to mute, I think. Hey guys, uh, uh, I think that's Alex. Alex, can you mute, mute your phone? Yes. Please? Oh, sorry, sorry. There you go. All yeah. right. Sorry about that. Uh, so, I mean, you know, essentially it's good self care. And the trick is going to be most people, again, it might be miserable, but you're going to do fine. Um, folks who are a bit older and have some underlying issues. It's like sensitivity. When do you go to the hospital, the emergency room? Because in general, you want to be avoiding those places uh, to not get others sick. And they're going to, depending where you live, might be a bit overrun. So there's the challenge of not waiting too long, but also not going too early. And I would, I would there's a couple of tests I've heard about, like if you're able to hold your breath for 10 seconds and you might you know, be coughing a lot, that's probably a good prognostic sign. If you're feeling more and more short of breath, you might, number one, be in contact with your clin clinic clinician by telemedicine or phone and get early guidance of potentially where to potentially go, uh, potentially early, because there may be certain facilities that are full, out of ventilators, who knows? And someone just, um, I wanted to pack my on the fort. it was like Eddie saying that they've uh, sold 5,000 ventilators to the state of California in the last few days. You know, there's a lot of activity going on in spooling up regular ventilators and versions that are sort of hacked together. I think there's gonna be another challenge. Um, there's not that many intensive care unit doctors or nurses um, do we need sort of platforms to help like an AI chat bot to help you run a ventilator and mm. upskill, you know, the average floor nurse or psychiatrist is going to get pulled into the clinic to, to operate some of these things. Let's but, actually bring Eddie on. Eddie, I want to bring you on. Uh, one of Eddie's claim to fame uh, is he is the creator of the George Foreman Grill. So Eddie, what is your question for Daniel Kraft? Eddie? Is that you? Uh, I had to unmute myself. Okay, let's see you, Eddie. Uh, I didn't have a question, but I was just basically saying that, you know, I think a lot of the lack of materials, because we were dealing with New York State, um, they ordered 10,000 um, ventilators from us, and we broke into the system, and then they reneged on it, and then they went on the news and said that nobody is shipping it to them. So then I flipped it around and sold it to California and another 10,000 tomorrow to Illinois. So... I, I'm just, I, I don't want to talk about politics, but I think it's political. Okay. Well, let's not talk about politics, but I appreciate that. Eddie. <laughs> let's, let's go over to Griff. Griff, you have a question. What is your question, sir? As I'm going to you guys. I have a question and a comment. Yes, sir. Uh, I'll start with the comment. So um, I'm not a big data guy, but I'm a math guy. And one of the things I learned in building big math models is we're at the point where individual research is trash or not trash but right now it's about meta-analysis taking the analysis from uh, Italy from China from all over the world and creating bigger uh, data sets that point to specific directions I hear a lot of people talking about sample size and correlation and causation and the problem with the sample size mathematically speaking we can still extrapolate what's happening even in a small scattered sample size it's not specific but that data combined with other metadata can give us a pretty good picture that's it so uh, the question is it's kind of two um i have uh, uh somebody who's special to me who uh has stage four breast cancer 
uh, who's being successfully treated with eye brands, but she's very high risk. And yesterday she got a high fever um, and she got scared. And she's somebody I spent a lot of years with and I love very deeply. And I was ready to hop on my motorcycle and go sit with her. So the questions are, um, from a human standpoint, um, I'm a healthy old dude, but I'm a healthy guy. I mean, I'm 52. At what point is that risk reward? Obviously, it's an individual decision, but can you give me some guidance on that? And then the second thing, today I had uh, the business channel on, and they did a short piece about a tobacco company that was showing promise reports or, or promise results on a did, have you seen any of this that the apparently are coming up with um um oh why is my brain not working well you said it, you're 52 years old you're really yeah, uh, a vaccine that a vaccine based on the tobacco plant have you seen this because under the heading of total irony wouldn't it be hilarious if the tobacco company saved us all <laughs> Number one, 52 is not old. <laughs> so I think, no, not at all. Uh, um, for your friend, uh, you know, I, I'm an oncologist. Many oncology cancer patients get fevers frequently. The first thing to know is, did she recently get chemotherapy and our count's really low? And is she at risk for bacterial or other infections? And if she is, um, you know, often we bring them into clinic, take a blood sample, sometimes start them on antibiotics. It all depends on what her immune system is. So if she recently got chemotherapy, uh, and she's very immunocompromised. She might need some simple, not simple, but uh, oral or IV antibiotics in the interim. So that's one thing. So she, make sure she's in touch with her oncologist. I don't think it would be a bad thing. I mean, part of the challenge is, you know, how do we support our friends and neighbor and family and do that safely? Um, I, I'm, I'm probably most likely her fever's not from COVID unless she had some known exposures um, or she was recently in a clinic, which is possible. That belies the other question. You know, these emergency rooms, particularly in New York, are being overrun, but it's not like people are not going to still have heart attacks or have needed cancer therapy or their immunotherapy for autoimmune disease or their diabetes care. So how do we start to balance normal clinical care uh, and not triage it all the way down the pole uh, and have other people die needlessly? Obviously, you can wait for your elective hip replacement, but you may not be able to wait for your elective, you know, uh, gallbladder surgery if you have an infected gallbladder. Um, so... I would think it's probably okay, just do basic precautions. If you have a mask, wear it, um, wash your hands a lot, um, and, and just be super mindful. All right. Uh, on the tobacco thing, real quick, that's a, not a new story. Basically, tobacco plants have been used where you can engineer in like DNA or other elements, and then they can grow a molecule, and you can harvest the, back, back, the, 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 the tobacco plant leaf and extract that, um, in this case, it might be a, a part of a vaccine or a protein and use that therapeutically. So it's not a new concept, but tobacco plants are a potential fast way of growing something at scale, sort of a bioreactor that can be used for, for drugs or vaccines. We got about 10 more minutes with Daniel. So guys, get your questions in. I'm not sure if this is gonna work. I asked Dr. Varsney, who spoke three weeks ago at Metal. She's in Bali right now. And let's see if we're able, she has a question. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna unmute. And let's see if we can get her question. All right. Varsity, what is your question for Dr. Kraft? Hi. Um, hey, everyone. Hey. Dr. Kraft, thank you so much for jumping on and giving such enlightening information. You shared a lot of important data. I actually didn't have a question. I had just made a comment about if you are not needing hospitalization and you have symptoms at home to use some antivirals that are over the counter, like, you know, uh, colloidal silver grapefruit seed extract, neem is an Ayurvedic herb, and it's showing, it's showing signs of decreasing and speeding up the healing process from flu-like symptoms, because COVID is a bunch of different symptoms presenting in different areas as more aggressive with respiratory, less aggressive with respiratory, et cetera, but it is fundamentally viral. So antivirals are showing to help speed up the process of healing. So if you don't need hospitalization and you're at home wanting to get through it, that's an option. What's your thought on that? Thank you very much, Varsity. What's your thought on that, Daniel? Um, I think there are some natural compounds and others that um, if they're not antiviral purely, they may be enhancing your immune system. So one thing that I have been doing, I'm friends with Paul Stamets. Some of you know he's sort of the world's famous mycologist. And uh, 
few years ago, he sent me a whole case of, of mushroom extracts from things like, uh, I can't remember all the names of them, um, uh, uh, but bottom line, they're, they help enhance natural killer cell function. Natural killer cells are involved in fighting cancer and, and viral infections. So I figure, you know, for me and my wife, it can't hurt to take some, um, some of these fungal extracts that seem to boost immunity uh, in, in vitro and in some preliminary studies. And, and what Dr. Uh, Rashini was mentioning may be helpful. It, it's challenging right now to run a whole clinical trial where group A gets it and group B doesn't. Um, but things like zinc and some of the things uh, that others are, are, are talking about probably couldn't hurt. Um, and both for protecting you and then if you do have it for faster recovery. It's interesting. Uh, she's actually saying uh, vitamin C in high doses. We had Daniel Kraft, or we had Daniel Kraft, you're Daniel Kraft. We had uh, Dave Asprey on, and Dave said the same thing. Take as much vitamin C as possible. Almost take it to where you just, you're going to have to go to the bathroom so bad. And that was one of the ways he directed, uh, he suggested us to actually try to flush it out of ourselves by doing high doses of C. Everyone's got their own remedies. Uh, hey, Daniel, what is the silver lining that you see behind this? What when you look at it going, all right, this is horrible, but where do you see the opportunities from this? I mean, I think, uh, you know, this is we're, it, we're essentially the biotech community has been galvanized. We're going to kind of science the shit out of this and hopefully very quickly find uh, drugs, new drugs, existing antiretrovirals, things like chloroquine, et cetera. That was FDA fast tracked and approved the other day with pretty weak evidence, but we're going to hopefully very quickly galvanize. Uh, effective vaccines and drugs. But the challenge is it still takes a year for vaccine really to get out there in a safe way because you can still have vaccines that have some of very bad side effects. But I think the big silver lining is that number one, we have a global enemy. You know, the, the virus doesn't know if you're red or blue or communist or socialist or whatever. Um, and so it's, we're, we have a common um, united element here around the planet that's galvanizing action. But hopefully some of the new connections, even like within this battle group, all the amazing people I'm able to meet with here and sometimes when I'm in LA, new connections will come from that. Um, uh, I, uh, I think, you know, it's going to galvanize a new way of doing healthcare going forward. Things that are being unleashed like telemedicine are going to come more and more commonly used because maybe people are doing it for the first time. Some regulations like HIPAA are being relaxed. Um, and then I, I hopeful that you know, when we get through this acute stage and the economy gets back up and we'll, we'll properly fund the sort of you know, global pandemic response and prevention network that really takes these things seriously and funds it appropriately um, and that um, we'll come out stronger from this. Here, let's go to Sam Boda. Sam, I see you have either a statement or a comment. Sam, can you pop on your video and let's see what you have to say. There you are, Sam. I'm unmuting you and you're unmuted. You know Last, uh, last year, you know, because my brain was so weak after the accident, last year I was diagnosed with the incurable. And I went to Carson City, Nevada for four months, and I also spent a lot of time in Campbell, California. Dave Asprey referred me to Matthew Cook, MD, at BioReset Medical. And he gave me, over time, several injections of exosomes into my spine. And I believe that that is what cured it, along with... Um, multi-pass ozone every day, four days a week for four months. I'm the only person in the world cured of this. And, and uh, so he also gave me high dose vitamin C every day by IV, high dose uh, glutathione by IV as well. And uh, in that clinic, people were flying in from all over the world and I saw cancer patient after cancer patient cured with a combination of the things I've just mentioned, plus IPT, which is using the this much chemo instead of that much per treatment um, after giving them insulin, which kills all of the, which uh, they give them insulin after a couple of days of basically fasting. And so those cancer cells are really starving at that point because sugar is their food. So he gave them um, insulin and then a couple of days later, glucose with a little bit of chemo. And that made the cancer cells eat all that up and killed themselves. I was amazed. I mean, every week people were crying in there because, you know, the families come in, they're crying because the person gets cured. It's, it's insane. But Dave Asprey saved my life by referring me to Matthew Cook, MD at BioReset Medical, and also Frank Schallenberger, MD in Carson City, Nevada. Thank you for that, Sam. I really appreciate it. Did you get all that, Daniel? Got it. Sam, what was your diagnosis? Um, I was... Uh, 
the CJD, I was diagnosed with a human form of mad cow. Yeah, Jakob Crossland as well. Yeah, I mean, some of these things are so rare and it's super hard to do a big double blind placebo controlled trial. Uh, and it may be, hopefully those things really uh, effectively work. And it's often hard to get those in tr traditional medicine because they're something you can't patent. You did mention this whole insulin thing. Um, there is a lot of interesting work, you know, it's, it's almost called, uh, now we're recognizing the importance of sleep. So if you guys are doing nothing else for your immune function and everything else, get, try and get your eight hours in now. But there's this new field almost being called chronobiology or-, or, or um, Chronotypes. Circadian medicine. Yeah. Meaning when you take your medicine, whether it's your insulin or your aspirin, it depends on what time of, time of day you take it. That might be your insulin and, and cortisol levels may be different. And uh, chemotherapy will work under different sugar and stress reactions. So there's still such a long way to go in sort of precision personalized medicine. And some of the elements that, um, that Sam was mentioning may play a role in, in very rare diseases, but in others. And circadian medicine, when you take your drugs and how, what dose and uh, others may be important to understand. Daniel, I really appreciate this. Uh, you spending time with us and give us your insight. Uh, just a, a, a quick tease. Tomorrow, one o'clock, we're doing uh, our a mentoring class and we have Shaheen Shahan. Just to give you an idea, this guy was homeless living on the beach two years later. He has 400 people working for him, making $350 million a year. He's our mentor tomorrow at one o'clock. He's been a hardcore metal member for over a decade. He invented the vaporizer, <laughs> the vape. And he's done so many other things, does about $100 million a year just on Amazon. So he's going to give us some insight of what it takes to really understand e-commerce and how to hack it. So that's at 1 o'clock tomorrow for you metal members. Uh, Daniel, any last words from you? You're about to say goodbye. We have a great group today. I mean, we got it up to almost 40. And uh, we're here. We're all waiting for your wisdom. Any last words from you? Wow. Well, again, I think we're... We're early on in this pandemic. I mean, we're, we're kind of the middle of the beginning. And uh, I think as even our politicians have woken up to, um, things are gonna get a lot worse before they get better. So buckle up. I think we can all do optimal ways to keep ourselves and our friends and family healthy. You mentioned vaping. I'll just that cue the thought that anything that might be impacting your lungs right now probably is not the best thing to be doing proactively. Yeah. So I would hold off on any kind of elements that uh, impact your lungs as, as much as you can. Um, and there's going to be a lot of this does, do it, this does have a long-term effect. I mean, if I do get Corona or somebody gets it, we do see damage to the lungs for, I mean, just permanent, right? Permanent damage. It seems that some have the, a lot of the folks who are getting intubated in the ICU on the ventilators, they have something called ARDS, which is basically super immune reaction to your own lungs and they kind of shut down. Um, and so there may be long-term lung effects. The bottom line, the healthier you can make your lungs before potentially getting sick, the better you'll probably do if you do get it. And given that there's some statistics that, you know, 40 to 60% of us may get uh, coronavirus sometime in the next couple of years, anything you do to optimize your health is, is, is a good thing. And there's going to be a lot of good information and bad information. There's already a disinformation war going on on the internet. A lot of folks are still calling it a hoax. Um, and that may go to, you know, everything, and I, I haven't validated everything from, you know, take this vitamin or that vitamin, or this will work or that works. So, you know, as a community with metal and beyond, it's great to share these things. The more we can kind of figure out what's really working and validated, um, the better we'll all be. Not that we can't be early movers in some of these things uh, as well. So um, I would say, you know, uh, and I think, you know, this, the, the Chinese term crisis is, is also a time for opportunity. Um, so it's a chance to rethink business models and our personal lives and our connections to others. And, and hopefully we'll come out of this um, stronger so um but it's definitely gonna be a challenging time so thanks daniel Kraft, thanks a lot buddy for hanging out with us thank, thank you, you thank you see you all later daniel thanks a lot for sharing your time you and everyone we'll see you all later bye everyone thank you bye. Thanks.